Well, good morning. We're working through a series this summer for the month of August called Uncharted. And we're trying to figure out how do we get some direction from God in our life? How do we hear Him? How do we find out what we're supposed to do, where we're supposed to go, how we're supposed to live? And so that's kind of the topic. And I think for, for a lot of us, I think we wish sometimes that we could kind of sit down and we could kind of sit God down for a minute and we could have this conversation and we could ask him some things going on in your life and what's happening and why are you allowing this and, and what's going on with me? But, or maybe where should I turn here or what should I do next or what is my relationship going to look like or what is this all about or um, am I going to get better? Am I not going to get... And we'd love to have this interaction. And my desire is, as we kind of get through this series, that it'll be very crystal clear that this is actually more of God's desire than it is even of yours. That he desires that we would sit down, that we would spend time with him, that we would listen, that we would converse about life that we would get direction from him. And in fact, he's provided everything possible to make this take place. In my sinful nature, you know, this, this couldn't happen, but through Jesus Christ paying the debt of my sin on the cross and purifying me and putting a spirit in me, I can have this kind of relationship. It's a longing in us, actually, that he's placed there. But it's actually a longing that in Christ he's able to fulfill. And so that's what my hope and my desire is that at the end of this process of figuring this out, that we wouldn't wander in life and wonder in life, how is it do I find my way? That we would know how to go to the source and how to hear him well. So let's just pray as we continue in this series as we look at God's word together. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word, your living word, your son, Jesus Christ for providing the way for a relationship like this with you. We thank you for your written word, that it helps us find our way, that it guides our feet, it guides our path, it shows us in the way to walk. Would you teach us your word today? We pray that we would walk away here knowing how to go forward in whatever situation we find ourselves today. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. It's a common question, really, that we all kind of face in your neighbors and your coworkers and everyone around you and your family. What is my life all about? What's my purpose? Why am I here? What am I good at? What do I want to do? Where should I go? Who should I go and do that with? There's so many questions, and if you listen around work or you listen around your, it's kind of what everyone's consumed about. You know, like, I'm trying to find direction and what to do and how do I handle my children or what do I do with this crazy spouse or what do I do with my crazy boss or what do I do with my crazy neighbor who drives me nuts? You know, we, we kind of like, we always think we're the normal ones, so I use crazy externally, right? The crazy drivers, we're the normal. But how do I handle all these situations? Here's what scripture would say, I think, to us today, is that he doesn't actually want us to walk around with like that. He actually wants us to know his heart. He wants us to know how to live with people, with him, in situations. He doesn't want us to be clueless, so he's chosen to reveal himself. So often, though, when we try to find out what life's all about or where we're going to go, we, we look at the wrong thing first. We always start with ourselves. So if you look at society, often they'll tell you to, you know, go to a a self-help conference or go get a book on how to know yourself and who are you on the inside and what are your strengths or what are your weaknesses or um, what are you passionate about and what, you know, what's your past tell you about you or what do the stars tell you about you or who knows. But it's always kind of look at yourself and you will know. You do what feels, what feels good to you. And, and, then, and then live that out. Touch, get in touch with your inner self or who you really are. And it sounds actually pretty good because it sounds like, yeah, you want to be fulfilled and you want to be successful. But the question is, what is fulfilling and what is success? And when we look around, we see people that we think should feel fulfilled and feel successful. 
And often they're asking the exact same questions we are, which is what is the meaning to this? Why doesn't this fill me up? Why isn't this making sense? So I always kind of look to the stars and we look to the rich and we look to these people and we think, what is their problem? I'm trying to get where they're at. And when they get there, they're trying to go somewhere else. It shouldn't be that way with us. And so what we learn from the Bible is that it, it simply teaches us that everything finds its meaning, its purpose, its direction, and its future in relationship with the Father. And uh, Eugene Peterson wrote um, the paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. And in that, in Colossians um, chapter 1, he summarizes a couple verses, and this is what he says. Everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and the invisible, everything got started in him and will find its purpose in him. You were made, actually, for an amazing purpose. You were made for a reason. You're not an accident, and you're not even here today by accident, even if you came kicking and screaming. You're here because God has something intended for you. Uh, a few years back, you'll remember uh, Rick Warren wrote the book, The Purpose Driven Life, and it was just an instant hit. It was the top seller for several years. It, the only book it actually didn't outsell was the Bible itself. And in that book, being a believer, actually a pastor in California, the very first line, it was, it was, he was on CNN, he was on Larry King, he was everywhere he could be because everyone was b just baffled that people were actually wanting to read this book. Do you know why? Because the very first line of the book is this, it's not about you. No one could figure out why anyone would want to read a self-help book that they thought it was from a secular perspective. It's purpose-driven life, driven life. That's, you know, all the leadership books. That's what we do. We get driven. We live to the fullest. And that the first line of a book could start with, it has nothing to do with you, would actually sell off the, like that. But based on Scripture, that is exactly what the Bible teaches us. It's a poor starting point. When we try to make sense of life, when we try to figure out our direction, we're compasslessness in a sense. We don't have one. And so if we think it's ourself, how I'm feeling, how I feel about the situation, how I feel about this relationship, how I feel about this career, how I feel about money, how, how I feel guides me. But we know, if you know anyone that's lived that way, they get to the point where it just comes to ruins all around them. The Bible, the Word of God for the believer, for the follower of Jesus, is our compass. It keeps us following Jesus. It always guides us back into relationship with Him. So when we find ourselves messing up, or we found ourselves lost, or you found yourself where you don't know where you are today, I want you to know that God's Word is a compass. But the compass will not guide you to yourself. It'll guide you to your creator. It'll guide you to who you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be all about. That's what God's word does for us. And so we then need to understand the scriptures. We need to read his word. If, if there's that much good news that much information and that much guidance found in God's word, then we should be immersing ourselves in it. And so what does God's word do for us? It reveals several things. It reveals who God is. It reveals his character. It doesn't tell us everything of how God does everything. Sometimes, you know, that's what we're hoping, right? Now, God, how did you figure out that animal be able to do that or where did this and he doesn't do that this is a relational book it helps us most in the areas of discovering what God is like he does not want us to worship an unknown God it's where one of the things we learn right off the bat is that he does not want us to worship an unknown God. He does not want us to worship an idol. He doesn't want us to make something up to worship. He wants us to know him. And so he tells us who he is. 
It was his initiative to reveal himself to us. It tells us then, in light of that, who we are where we will find our purpose and meaning. It reveals in scriptures what God's heart is. In other words, what gets him excited? What gets him passionate? What does he long for? Ultimately, we learn that he longs for a relationship with us, which is fulfilled in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We learn his purposes. We learn his agenda. We learn the story what God is up to. We learn the fact that we're actually living in his story right now and that it's not finished. There's more to come. Next week, you want to come back. Um, Pastor Dan and Pastor Denise are going to be up here actually using these chairs better than me. And they're going to be talking about this. How do we find direction in the midst of a story that God is in the middle writing? Where are we? in the story, because we're actually in the midst of something he is about today. This Bible doesn't just tell us about what history was. It's active today, and it shows us how we play a part today. And so you get to hear about that a little bit next week. God then also, through his word, reveals to us how do we have a relationship with him? How do we have a relationship with your creator? How do you have a relationship with him today? Well, it's in here. And then he also tells us how to then have a relationship with each other. How do we get along with those who don't like us or we don't like? How do we even get along with those that we want to like? How do we relate to one another? It's in God's word. What you have to understand here at Crossroads is we truly believe that the Bible is God's revelation to us. What that means is he chose to reveal this truth to us. It was his idea that we would get to know him. And so through people inspired by his Holy Spirit, he's written to us story and letters and has given them and put them in our hands that we would not be uninformed but that we would be able to know who he was. It is his initiative. It is not ours. He does not want us, like I said, to make him up in our own ideas. In fact, in Psalm 81, when Israel was not listening, not following his word, he said, my people, they wouldn't listen. Israel, they didn't want me around. He was bugging their life. So I let them follow their stubborn desires and let them live according to their own ideas. See, the truth is, God never forces us to live in the word, to abide by the word. He eventually lets us go and say, you know what? If you truly desire to do your own thing, then go ahead. Desire your own thing. Follow it. You have your own ideas of how things work in life. You have your own philosophies. Go ahead. Try that out. But in this passage, he says, although that my people would just listen to me. Why? So he could have robots? So he could have people just do whatever he wants and all his whims? No, because what happened to his people when they didn't follow, when they didn't listen, is they ended up surrounded by their enemies and in bondage and captivity. And it breaks his heart when he sees his people in brokenness. When he sees them held captive by all this junk in their lives, or all these things they allowed creep in, their own ideas, their own philosophy, their own desires. They didn't want to follow his ways. They don't think this applies today. They try their own thing, and it breaks his heart when his people live in ruin. Oh, that they would, oh, that they would listen. Oh, that they would walk in my ways. Then they have no idea how quickly I would take away the enemy. I'd bring about healing in their land and in their people. God's word is to shape our life. I want to talk about, as I was, uh, how this kind of shaping works. Often, I think, what, we, what we're looking for, and I... 
you know, there's probably, if, when I say I'm going to sit down with God and have a relationship, you're probably like, I'm all ears because there is like this one question that's really bothering me. And there's one thing that if God could just answer straight out, and it's specific. And I know you're talking about God's word generic, and it's like, I get that. And you're arguing with me while I'm hopefully, you know, you're wrestling a bit, saying, I just want specifics. It's specifics. But I need to first talk about, just like last week we talked about preparing ourselves to hear from him. This week we're talking about how do we actually see God's word as a framework? How do we understand that it frames our lives in such a way? Because if you get that, then what happens is a lot of the struggles, a lot of the pain, a lot of the issues that most people out there are struggling with today become answered within the framework. And we're not tossed around by every idea. We're actually able to stand on solid ground. It becomes our compass. It becomes our guide. It becomes our frame. And so I was driving home Friday, done my sermon. And, and as soon as I get up, you know, out of a desk, it's like my brain functions again. Somehow there's a switch somewhere around that area that turns back on. And so as I was driving home thinking, okay, I'm done, God was just giving me this picture of what, what this word does for us. What is it like when we know his word, when we trust his word? And he's like, it's a, it's a framework. It's actually a window. It's a picture. It's a, an understanding. His word provides for us these things we've been talking about. God's heart, his passions, his desire. It provides to us to get to know him, his character, and what he's like. And as I said, it teaches us how to love others, and it teaches us how to love him. It's a framework. It's a view in which we see life. And if we follow this way, it actually impacts majority of our decisions today that the world struggles with. And so the question is, what is your framework? Do you allow God to create the framework, or are you going to be like the people of Israel and try to create a framework from your own experience and your own understanding? The problem is what God teaches us through his word in Isaiah 55 is this, that my thoughts and his thoughts are not even close. That my ways of living life and his ways of doing life are not even close. And when I imagine and picture what life can look like, it says that his way of seeing life is far beyond what I can comprehend. His ways and my ways are not the same. And so when I try to build a frame around me and my understanding, things crumble. Things don't stand up. Things don't make sense. But people do this all the time. And often, we as Christians begin to do this. Instead of going to God's word to create a framework for our life, we go to our experiences. And we say, well, this is what I've learned about relationships. You'll find lots of that on Facebook. You know, what I've learned is this. Don't let anyone do this to you again. Learn that. It's becoming part of my framework. I learned that in my framework that you don't trust anybody or keep your enemies close and your, you know, like all these frameworks. And people start to actually, they're catchphrases, but they actually start building a way of living around these things. If the relationship doesn't work for you, then find something that does. Life's too short to be unhappy like that. They create a framework. They're building a perspective of life. They create frameworks of raising kids, a framework of what success looks like and what it doesn't look like. And they start building a structure around it. But if you, like me, look around, you'll see eventually that these frameworks don't hold. That it only takes a slight breeze in someone's life to make it crash to the ground. When the people of Israel wandered for 40 years in the desert, refusing to listen to what God had to say about life, he let them wander. He let them learn. He's not in a hurry. He'll let them go into captivity. He'll let them go hungry. He'll let them die off. 
This is what was happening to his people. And finally, they decided to come back. Finally, they decided to come to him. And they decided that they wanted to follow him. And so they're about to take hold of some of the promises, go into a new land. And Joshua says to them, remember, be careful, obey. Let's not forget what Moses gave us for God's word. This time around, let's not deviate from them. Let's not turn any way to the right or to the left. Let's fix our eyes on them. He said, then if we do that, we will be successful in everything we do. Now, in our world, the issue of success is complex. But you have to understand, the issue of success in God's word is fulfilling what God designed for you which is in line with what he is all about. Success in our own eyes is fleeting. It doesn't last. So whenever scripture talks about successful living or being blessed living, we somehow interpret that and we filter that through what it would mean in our world's paradigm, in our world's framework. That must mean better money. That must mean a promotion. That must mean healthy situations. But in scripture, success means living a life according to the ways of God. It says, then you will be successful in the way that you walk. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and will you succeed in what you do. So we need to listen. We need to take the word in. We talked about last week preparing ourselves to hear. This week, we need to understand that we need to listen. And why we do, we gather together today as his body to listen to his word. We open the scriptures in the morning or in the evening alone with our father or with others to listen to what he has to say. We have to plant the seeds of his word. We can't expect prosperity. We can't expect fruit, success, all these things in God's ways if we don't actually input God's word into our life. We need to listen. God wants us to know him. He wants us to know how to live life and do it well. He doesn't want us to not have hope. He wants us to have hope. He doesn't want us to be discouraged. He wants to have, give us peace. We find how in the scriptures. The next thing we need to do, it says, is we need to embrace the word. We actually need to embrace it. What does that mean to embrace it? Well, it's one thing to read it. So as a congregation, we're reading the New Testament together. That's great, and we need to read it. We need to plant the seeds. For most of us here, we probably haven't gone through it before like that. We need to go through the Word. We need to understand the framework. We need to understand what God says about loving other people, about loving Him, about His character, about His plan. We need to know that. If we don't know His framework, how do we make decisions going forward in His ways? And so we do need to listen, we do need input, but we need to embrace it, which means reflect upon it, which means if you look at all the verses in Psalm 119, or you look at the passages we're looking at in Joshua, he says to meditate on it. And we're not good at those words. What does it mean to meditate? Are you just going to, um, no, it's, we don't, what meditate, it, one of the best ways, I'll give you a horrific picture, how's that, and then you won't forget What does meditate mean? It's kind of, the root word comes back to ruminate. A ruminate is the word that they use when a cow chews its cud. How's that? Now you'll remember. So what a cow does is it eats some grass, right? And then it chews and chews and chews and chews and chews and it swallows. And then it does something really disgusting. It kind of brings it back up and stomach one done. And then it chews and chews and chews and chews and chews and swallows again, and guess what? <laughs> Brings it back. This is four times. It's a big animal. It's eating grass for pity's sake. How do you think it survives? It has to get every little bit of nutrients out of the grass to survive. God says, that's what I want you to do with my word. I want you to look at it. I want you to read it, and then I want you to ponder it. I want you to chew on it. I want you to grill it with questions. 
I want you to think about your life and I want you to say, God, how does this apply? How does this work? This is what you said. And he wants us to walk away, chew on it, go throughout your day. I wonder what that means. Then come back to it and say, I'm going to read that again. I wonder what, oh, and you get a little bit more insight. And you know what he wants us to do? Do it again. That's meditating on it. It's chewing on it. It's getting everything out of it you can that God would reveal to us to transform the way that we walk. That is what it is. And may, that memorized word means when he, whenever the Bible says, place it deep in your heart or put it in your heart, it's talking about having the word in you so that you can recall, you can remember it, that it should come to memory. When you're facing temptation, it should pop into your memory. When you're facing a situation of discouragement, scripture should pop into your memory. When you're looking at a situation of grief and sorrow, you should have scripture come and revive you back in your, from your memory. And you'll say, maybe I, I can't memorize anything. The Greek word for that is baloney. <laughs> here's the truth. And I'm the worst at this, but here's what I know. And this is where God convicts me. And so you just, I, this is me on the table if you're not, that's fine. Have fun dissecting my life. That's fine. God says, you know, he says to me, Sean, you can remember. Thing is, what you need to know is you remember what's important to you. See, we all remember what's important to us. Some of you remember sports stats, draft times, dates, and you have a hard time remembering your anniversary, but you remember when the draft is. I don't know. Or some of you remember everyone's birthday because it's important to you. Some of you remember recipes. You know, people call you on the phone and like, hey, can you, have, can you get out your recipe? And you're like, no, no, I'm good. I got it. It's blah, 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 blah. How do you do that? Because it's obviously important to you. We meditate on, some of you could tell us all the stock prices this year and whether they went up and how many points and up and down. No offense, but it must be important to you. God wants his word to be like that for us, that we, we seek it out, we, we scrounge for it, we look for it, we find it, we put it inside of us, and we remember it because it's important to life itself. That's what the psalmist talks about in Psalm 119. That's what Joshua is telling the people they need to do. They need to embrace it, not just listen. It needs to go to their core. The last thing that we need to do then is we need to live inside of the word. We need to live into the word. It's not just enough to listen to it. It's not just enough to embrace it, but we must live it. So I have I've got to check out, I got a couple teenagers here, so I gotta be gentle on them. But I have teenagers, I love teenagers. I like the fact that a teenager gets to the point where you can have some major like dialogue interaction with them and they sometimes push a little bit because it means they're growing up and learning. And I don't mind that. But there's those moments, right, where you're frustrated with the teenager sometimes. And, uh, you know, it's like I, sometimes I'll ask my son to do the dishes. I'll be like, you know what, I need you to do this today. Here's what you need to do. Can you please do the dishes? And sometimes... Most of the time, you know, sometimes I come back a couple hours later, maybe I had to go somewhere and I come back, and I walk in there and I notice that nothing's changed. The dishes are still there. And so I could go up to my son and I'd say, son, do you remember what I asked you? He'd be like, you know what? I do remember what you asked me to do. I'm like, oh, that's good. Um, what was it? He said, I re memorized it. You said, do the dishes. Oh, that's awesome. But I wouldn't stop there. I'd probably press them a little bit and say, okay, I'm glad that you memorized that. Um, I'm wondering, though, if you really embraced it. He'd say, absolutely. You know what I did? I said, yeah, I noticed your friends are here, um, so it's hard for you to do it, but I'm embracing it. That those friends, do you know what? They came over here. We spent like a half an hour talking about what it would look like to clean the dishes. We got, like, we, embra we really wrestled with this. We compared, like, soaps, different types of techniques. 
whether we should towel dry, drip dry, sunlight or dawn. Like, we really wrestled with this. It was a deep, meaningful conversation. But at the end of the day, I want you to know, my expectations would be that they actually did the dishes. For us, it's just not enough to say, you know what, I memorized the word, I read the word, I got through the New Testament. I did it, check mark. You know what, I even memorized some great passages. Know it, check mark. You know what, I can even do it in Greek. I can say it in this way. I got, all, you know, it's still at the end of the day, not the heart of what God's word is meant to be. God's heart is that we would live into the framework of his world. that our position, the way we see life, our viewpoint, our understanding would be within the frame. There is so much that the world struggles with and questions in your neighbors, in your course. They're questioning so many things. And my frustration with all of us often is we have the same questions. But God desires our people, his people, myself, to not live like that. To not live like those with no hope. To not live like those with no direction, living aimless lives. People should look at our lives and they should notice that there's something different about the way that we live because we live within a framework of God's word. When times of grief show up, the scriptures say we shouldn't struggle with grief the same way. It doesn't say we shouldn't grieve. It says we shouldn't struggle the same way as the rest of the world. Why? Because we live in a different framework. We know the end of the story. We know the plan of God. We know the purposes of God. We have hope. When the world is struggling with their marriages and relationships around them, they, we shouldn't have the same questions. We should be able to rest on the framework, knowing the heart of God, knowing what it's about. When the rest of the world is struggling with morality or their sexuality, we shouldn't have the same confusion. We rest within the framework. It frees us. It's not a prison. It frees us from the worries and the struggles and the hopelessness that the world struggles with because we don't need to live that way. It's never God's desire that we would live that way. It's not a, a prison that confines the way we live. The framework is a safety to the way we live so that we don't end up in bondage, so that we don't end up in crisis, so that our relationships don't look like the rest of the world, so our marriages don't end up like everyone else's, so that our kids don't end up like everyone else's, so our career path looks different, so our finances look different. Everything about our life, if it's framed in God's word, will give him glory when people look at us. They won't look at us and say, wow, are they wise. Look at what they did. They'll go, that's because... They trusted God's word. All throughout scripture, Psalm 119 is your homework today. Go home and read it. God tells us over and over again, if you trust my word, if you trust my way, the way you love people, the way you do life with me, if you trust me in those things, I will protect you. I'll be a rock. I'll be a shelter. I'll be a guide. I'll be a fortress. I'll subdue your enemies. I will bring your crops back to life. I will renew your days that have been wasted. I will do all these things. If you will live within my word, you will find life, not religion. Religion is when we try to become frame experts and we talk about the frame. We memorize the frame. We hold, we put the frame even on our wall sometimes, right? 
as a follower of Jesus Christ, a believer, a Christian is not someone who's figured out the framework. It is someone who lives within the frame. That's the difference. I was reading Dallas Willard this week. This is what he says. It is better to have 10 good verses transferred into the substance of our lives than to have every word of the Bible flash before our eyes. So, we're reading through the New Testament this summer, and if you've been keeping up, um, I haven't. <laughs> I'm trying. But it feels like that a little bit, doesn't it? I, I got to admit, it feels like it's flashing before the eyes, and you're like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I want to stop here and reflect on it. I, I got to keep going. I gotta... You know what? We, one of the reasons why we're still a supporter of that is this. There's so many people out there who claim to live by the framework, but actually don't even know the framework. They're trying. They're trying to have this relationship with God. They want direction. They want God to speak and tell me how this relationship's going and what am I supposed to do and where's my career headed and how do I help my kids and what do I do with retirement? And they want this so bad, but they're trying to create a frame still and it's based upon themselves and their life and their perspective. And what we're trying to hear today is that actually he's given us a framework. We need to read, understand, meditate, and know it so we know God's heart. And when we get that framework, into the DNA of our lives. It will save us from so many rabbit trails that we run down, and then we'll be able to hear God better because it's in the process of putting his word into my heart, I get to know his voice. The problem so often with many of us and myself is I run off for a quiet time, and I got 10 minutes, God, and I come over here, and I'm like, hey, I got this problem. I want to hear you but I don't know his voice. I haven't got to know him through his word. I haven't read about how he's related to people or what other people have experienced. I don't get the benefit of understanding the stories of God relating to others. And once I understand that, once I get that into me, then we will talk in a couple weeks about sitting down, saying, God, now my situation. I know your heart. I know your voice because I've read your voice so much. I, I, I know what you sound like. I know how you want me to live in this situation with others. I know you want me to forgive my enemies. I, I know you want me to reconcile with that person who's upset with me. How do I know all these things? Because those are questions I don't need to seek God's specific guidance for. There's questions that the whole world tries to figure out, and we actually don't need to even figure them out because we have a framework for that. I... A lot of our financial world, there's framework for that in Scripture. And when people hurt me and they do nasty things, I don't need to actually seek God's voice on whether or not I need to forgive them. Should I or should I not? God's Scripture is clear. You need to forgive. And whenever possible, you need to reconcile. I know that. So when I come to him, I don't come to him with random questions. I come to him inside of the frame and I say, I know your word. I know your heart for this situation. Specifically now, I want to know what am I supposed to do within that? And then I'm able to wrestle with God with my life in light of what he's all about. But when we try to do that, and we don't know the frame, or we don't understand the frame, or worse yet, we don't even agree with it, how do you expect to hear the specifics? And so today our challenge is how do we approach God's word? We listen to it. We need to put it in our life. We need to embrace it. We need to put it into our DNA. But then we need to live it and walk in his ways. It's my prayer for us today that we would do that. That we wouldn't be tossed around like the rest of the world with no hope, no understanding, and no purpose. God has given us all that in Jesus Christ. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that you're a God who wants us to know him. You don't want us to flounder. I thank you your heart doesn't want us to live in ruins. Doesn't want us to live in slavery. Doesn't want us, you don't want us to be in bondage. You don't want us to face heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak. Holy Father, would you teach us through your word how to walk in your ways? Not because nothing bad will happen, but because then we'll be able to understand who you are. And we will have hope when things look hopeless. We'll have peace in the midst of chaos. We'll have direction when the whole world is going their own way. Thank you for your word. May we hear it, embrace it, and live it this week. Amen.